Uh, I'd love to share a bit about who the hell I am, what I care about and what I know a few things about, and then I'd love to make this more interactive. Uh, just, you know, if you, guys, if you guys have questions about entrepreneurship, being a founder, going through an incubator program, raising money, but also more specifically, hustling, closing deals, making things happen that are very hard, uh, then let's talk about that, and I'll share whatever, whatever I know. So, a little bit about myself. I grew up, so I'm originally from Greece, but I grew up in Germany. I have the best that Europe has to offer, you know, a little bit of German, a little bit of Greece culture. Uh, I dropped out of high school when I was 17, 18 to start my first business, and I've never been employed in my life for a Completely unemployable, I have zero qualification. None of you guys would ever hire me for anything. So when people ask me, why did you choose entrepreneurship, I, I always say lack of options. Like, there's not that much that I could do, so I had to do this. Um, so I've done a few very small businesses back in Europe, and then eight years ago, I had this, what I thought, this huge idea that would be world changing. And since I knew nothing about technology, uh, I decided to sell everything. I had a bottle of one-way ticket and came to San Francisco. And at SFO, I asked someone how to get to Silicon Valley. Just to give you, just to give you like a, a you know, a, a taste for like what my sophistication level was back then. Uh, so the first person I asked went like, "Want to go to Palo Alto, Stanford University?" And I was like, "That sounds awesome. How do I get there?" And they're like, "Well, you take the spark, and then you go to the culture haven." And that's how I kind of found my way to Palo Alto, uh, and uh, it's been a pretty wild ride. So my first startup failed pretty miserably, uh, and it was a pretty painful experience. I worked on that thing for five years, uh, and I got uh, pretty depressed towards the end, although I thought before that startup that depression was kind of a, a mythical excuse for people that are weak. Uh, I burned out pretty heavily, which was also something I thought people invented, so they, they wouldn't have to say I quit. Uh, so I worked like 19 hours, seven days a week. Was only eating, you know, drinking Red Bull, eating pizza, no vacations, no time off, just in front of my laptop all day long, just working. And uh, you know, because I thought that was what it takes <coughs> to be successful. And uh, obviously, I was wrong. So that didn't that didn't work out that plan. So I did a few things afterwards, but the most relevant thing for you guys was my last company. So we started about you know three years ago. And when we started, the company was called Elastic Sales. And what we did is we offered B2B startups in Silicon Valley that were venture funded a sales team on demand. So companies that had a few customers, a little bit of revenue, and over a million in funding, and were like, we need to figure the sales thing out. You know, we need to get more customers and grow. These companies would come to us, and we would do sales for them as them. So we would represent them to customers. We'd set up teams and go out there and generate leads close these leads, and then pass them over to them. And that, puts us in, that put us in a pretty unique uh, position because we, you know, we get sales for over 200 venture-backed startups. And we talk to every B2B startup in the Valley. Like every week, we talk to all of the B2B startups. So we had this unique knowledge base of knowing exactly what companies are doing, what they're struggling with. A lot of companies that you guys are customers of or really love and know, we did sales. We, some of my guys might have sold you or sold somebody at a bigger company on it. And you would never know we were like the best kept secret in Silicon Valley. Because if you were not our customer, you wouldn't know we existed. But we sold to a ton of customers. We sold for a ton of, ton of businesses. So when we started the Elastic Sales, from day one, we were like, all. Oh, so if we want to build this massive sales organization that does sales for all these different technology companies, we need. So we should build software that powers that, that allows us to do that in a scalable fashion. And uh, because we hate all sales software that's out there, we think it sucks. Let's just build something better for ourselves. That's how we started building sales software. And at first, the whole name of the software was Secret Soft. Like that's it. And it was never intended to be a commercial product. Um, for the first six months, we didn't really have a vision for the software. All we did is we had this this room like this full of salespeople, and then we had engineers sitting next to the salespeople and go. Why did you do? Why? Why do you? Why do you still use all this paper to write notes? Like this is fucking stupid. Or well, why do you do this? Or why do you do that? Or salespeople would go, Why does this fucking piece of software not do this when I wanted to do that? So our engineers built software in a very different environment than most engineers <laughs> build software. And uh, after a while, we really got a vision for what good sales software looked like and what our philosophy was. And the software got better and better. Eventually, it got so good that people wanted to buy it. Uh, and eventually so many people wanted to buy it 
that a small team internally started lobbying that we needed to release the software. I personally, as the CEO and, and founder, would like to claim the visionary move of shifting from the services business to the software business, but it was not. Re I resisted that shift. Uh, every time it was brought up, I would be like, I know the software is amazing, but I have a hard time running this massive services business. The last thing I need is another business to run right now. Let's just do this later when we have a bit, of, a bit more of a stable company running here. Um, but as always in life, the person with the highest level of clarity wins. So the guys internally that wanted to release the software were much more clear on that than I was on not releasing it. So at every opportunity, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, drinks, everywhere and everywhere, every single meeting, this guy would go, when are we going to release the software? You know, when are we going to release the software? We should really release the software. The software is the future. We need to start the future now. Like at any opportunity, very uncomfortably and painfully for me, until at one weak moment, I went, all right, fuck it, let's do it. All right, just take three people. This is your office. You're three months. You're launching. I don't want to hear about it anymore. It's like, all right, you know, it was gone. I didn't see him for three months. And then we launched the software. And as an entrepreneur, I've been wrong my entire life, almost about everything and anything I've ever thought about. Uh, and once in a while, there are very few instances, I'm actually happy that I was wrong. This was one of them. I thought that our product was amazing, but I thought it would take many, many years for us to grow the product side of the business to the level of the services business in terms of revenue. You know, SaaS products don't necessarily grow explosively from month one, especially if you just have like four people working on them with no budget or marketing or nothing. Um, and I was wrong. We launched the software. The first month was pretty fucking awesome. We're all like, all right, that's first month. Second month was better. First month, but, ah, all right, this is still a little bit of, it's a new thing. It's going to wait off. The third month was better than the second, and it never stopped. And after six to nine months, we're like, we better get off the services thing and fully focus on the software thing, right? Because it's clear that in a very short period of time, it's going to make more money and in a lot more profit with four people over here than with 40 people over there. So that's what we did. And today, uh, Close.io is the, the main part of the business. That's all we do. Uh, we're very profitable. We're growing really fast. We're a tiny team and we're crushing the competition. It's much larger than us. And we love that. We, we, we absolutely love that. We have Thousands and thousands of uh, you know startups and technology companies around the world that are using our, <coughs> our our software and salespeople around the world. I talk to about 30 founders every week, and uh, and sales leaders in startups giving them advice uh, on B2B on sales on hustling and how to figure out a sales model that works that's predictable and repeatable. So I truly care about entrepreneurship and I truly care about sales and the hustle. So those are the things that, that I love and those are my entrepreneurial superpowers. Uh, that's what I'm here to talk about, right? So I'd love to hear you guys' questions, challenges. I mean, I can talk about anything and everything, right? You could ask me, like, oh, I like House of Cards the uh, latest season. I'll give you guys a 15-minute you know, talk about it <laughs> if you're interested. But the things that I think I can provide the most unique value are all around sales, hustle. And sales, sales doesn't just translate to customers. Sales is how to hire people. Sales is how to get press. Sales is how to close the round. I can talk about all these subjects, but I'll always talk about it from a sales perspective. Like how to, how to use communication to help somebody make a decision in your favor. Uh, all right, I think that's more than enough. Uh, let's see who's gonna be the, the, the first question of the night. All right, first question, set the tone right. You know, make it good. Uh, yeah, so aside from your team kind of pushing for you to move away from services with this software, I mean, what, were the, what was like kind of Obviously, you're wanting to like hold on to the services for a reason. I am sure you would make money at it. But like, what, what was the, the catalyst for that change aside from your team? How did you do that? All right, that's a great question. So, cameraman. The screen is blank. I don't think that means anything, but you should check on it. Um, let me repeat the question. Well, the question is, why did we decide to move to the product, and why did I want to hold on to the services business? So, the services business was making a lot of revenue, right? It was profitable, and I really loved it. I loved working with, I love being basically a VC fund that works with all these awesome startups, helping them on the sales side of things. Like, I just love that. Um, the, 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 so that's why we were holding on to it. The other reason why I didn't want to just easily launch a product business parallel was it was a very, very hard business to run. We had to hire all these people, then we'd have to make them productive, then we'd have to get the customers for those people. 
The problem is that the business was seasonal. So last quarter of the year, no, no, none of our customers wanted to start their sales campaign with us in November. None of them, right? Uh, a lot of businesses, we couldn't really effectively sell in December or January for them. So you have these seasonalities where over the entire year, if you're, you're capitalized well enough, you're very profitable. If you're not, which we weren't, we weren't capitalized enough at all, then you have like two months where there's dramatically less revenue. You have the same cost though, and you're in big trouble. And you have to come up with like, ma we have like magical brainstorming sessions, coming up with ideas that I'll make the next month that if you, if I, I wish I had recorded it because it was like dangerously crazy. What kind of ideas would, we'd be a business that makes like $180,000 in revenue a month and we have like 20, 30 full-time people on that. And it would be like, should we sell Christmas trees? It's like, all right, that's a valid idea to put on the whiteboard, right? It's like any and everything, like insurance, like we were like, what the fuck are we going to do to like compensate for a month with no revenue, right? But all this cost. So uh, it was a hard business to run. I loved it. it was going well, but it was also very challenging. Uh, so that's why I was holding on to it. I was very much focused on it, like figuring out how to get over the, 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 the hurdle of like having enough capital that it becomes a more stable business. And the decision-making process to launch the software, it was not that complicated. We got more and more people from the outside world telling us they think the software is awesome. Our salespeople would show it to other salespeople. They would call us and try to sell us on us selling them our software. Right? That's a good sign when the, the customers start calling you and telling you, forcing you to sell your software to them. So that was one thing. Uh, and then there was this team internally that was very passionate. Mostly the people that were working on the product were very passionate about it needs to be it's a company, it's ready, it needs to launch. That was it. And my, my whole, the entire decision making process in my head was like, all right, fuck it, let's do it. Which was basically, I don't want to deal with this discussion anymore. And that was it. That's all the, yeah, it turned out to be a really fucking great decision. But it was not like a massively meditated and strategic one, for sure. All right, next question. Yes. Um, I guess there's, there's so many CRMs out there, and that's like one of the key ingredients for, for, uh, for companies like us. Like, what makes you guys different? It's a great question. So, first of all, what's your company? Campbell. Alright, we're going to practice this. I'm going to ask you again. <laughs> you know, I, want to, I want you to give me the same answer, just the same name, but I want you to say it as if the, it's the best fucking name. <laughs> All right, so it's a company. Yeah. What's the company you work for? You can. I believe you. It's Kimball. It's Kimball. What? It was not where it was not a ten, but it moved from minus ten to like uh, five. Uh, five, uh, five, five, five. It doesn't matter. Do you have the new name already? Then it does not fucking care. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's the only name that exists. It's right. the only name that matters right now. Right. Right? If I meet you in 10 minutes and you have a better name, you tell me, exciting news, uh -huh. we rebranded. <laughs> <laughs> right? But for now, that's yeah. your name. Right? Cool. So, uh, so, oh, so the question was, CRM, there's a ton of them out there. <coughs> what the hell makes you different? First of all, this is an important point because if you had asked me, when I came here eight years ago, I wanted to change the world of education forever, and my definition of that was that every single human being would use my platform, and every business in this world would use my platform to find talent. So somebody asked me once, like, how did Silicon Valley make you more ambitious? I'm like, I came pretty ambitious, right? Now, I'm, if you look at what I'm working on, I'm probably less ambitious from the outside. I'm working on a CRM, sales software, like, who the fuck gives a shit? Like, how is this changing the world? But I'm having a bigger impact today than ever before in my life. So, the, coming back to the CRM, so I, I never set out to build a CRM, it just kind of happened, and we're awesome at it, so we just keep doing it. Uh, in terms of what makes us different, the main thing is really that we built the software to make salespeople more successful, which is, we're probably the only CRM that ever did that. Right? All CRMs claim that, but CRMs, traditionally, they were built as a database to track data, customer data, and it was traditionally sold to management to get reporting. The end user, which is the salesperson, gives a shit, right? make them put in the data, right, and shut the fuck up. So that's basically the paradigm of CRM. We build it because we're salespeople ourselves, just like I want something awesome that makes me better, right, or that, that I can use 10 hours a day without killing myself. Um, so that's just fundamentally, philosophically the difference. In terms of practicality, we build a CRM that is faster, simpler, 
It's focused on the communication piece. So we truly believe sales is communication. So a CRM needs to be a communication tool. So calling is, for instance, a good example where we have calling tightly integrated right out of the box. You launch Close.io, and you can make calls and receive calls from the platform, the software, the VoIP. And not just make and receive calls, but all calls are tracked, all calls are recorded. You can make a lot more calls, better calls. There's a shit ton of stuff that happens just magically because it's part of the whole product that you don't have in a traditional CRM. You can make a call here, and then you move over there to the CRM to tell the CRM what you just did. Um, you don't have to do any of that. So our customers see an instant bump in calls, sales calls, that make 30, 40 percent more sales calls, which means more money. And not just that, it's going to be a better experience. You're on, a, you're on a page of a prospect or lead, and you click a button, and that's it, you're calling them. Or when they call you, Closer pops up on the right lead page, and you know it's this really important deal, this very challenging, not to say annoying customer, whatever it is, you have instant contacts. You see a timeline of all communication in the past. So we have less data entry, we have better communication tools, so email calling is much more tight integrated, um, and we have a much more powerful search engine, which we never intended to build. This is another crazy thing. My, the whole purpose, the whole takeaway on, on the entrepreneurial side from my talk is going to be to make something really successful is kind of fucking random shit luck. Like that's, that's how Stelly made it, right? Um, that, that's really like when we, the first thing that we did was calling needs to be fucking amazing because we're calling all day long. And then we're like, we're sending a ton of email. What would be the best, most insane email integration ever? I don't want to BCC my CRM. I don't want to fucking forward things to my CRM. I don't want to copy paste emails into my CRM. So we set it up so you would put in your IMAP and SFTP credentials if you're a little bit more technical. And now magic. Like wherever and whenever you send an email that's related to some customer and somebody in the company, it's magically tracked. The moment you create a new opportunity, all your past email communication magically appears. You don't have to do any thinking, any copy and pasting, nothing. So we did a great job on calling, a great job on email. And what happened as a result was we had a lot more data because we tracked all these things automatically versus manually. And our data was a lot better. Yeah, I looked at many CRMs. Every single customer we got had a CRM, so we looked at it. right? And it's shocking. It's, it's a ton of bad data. right? Salespeople making shortcuts that they understand, but then when they leave, somebody else looks at that stuff and is like, what the hell is this? What does this mean? Right? The data is really, really bad. So because we had a lot more data and the data was accurate, we were able to build a search engine that was really, really powerful. Um, so in Closeout, I'll give you an example. In Closeout today, you can log in and say, show me all active opportunities in San Francisco. Every other CRM can do that too. Now that I have this, drill down further and show me only the ones where the last thing that happened was I sent them an email, they opened it, but they haven't replied it's been longer than seven days ago. Almost no CRM does that. Maybe one or two can come close to this. But in our case, you can drill even further and go, and out of don't just show me the ones that I sent an email and haven't gotten a reply, although I know they looked at the email. Show me the ones that, out of those, that I had a phone call before that was at least 10 minutes. So I know that we had a quality conversation before. No one, everybody, every other CRM is out of the race at this point. And we do that within seconds. We type this in the search query and we'll opt, you know, out of there and show you these are the leads. And then when you have them, you're like, these are the people I need to pull up with. You can write one email and auto email merge them to everybody. Nobody does that, that stuff in CRM. So we built a really, really good product because we didn't know and didn't care what everybody else was doing. We built it for ourselves and we got lucky that we did something. <coughs> Thanks for that amazing question that allowed me to just pitch the product. <laughs> but without appearing like I was eager to pitch the product. Who, who here, out of curiosity, who ever has heard of Bullseye before? A few people humbling. Something, you know, there's still more work to be done, which is also exciting. All right, so next question. You had a question, sir. I remember you. My it was memory gonna, it was is not that first question. I was going to say, how often do you watch the videos when you record yourself? It's a good question because the truth is, I don't watch every single video that I record. Um, I, re I, I record, so I do a lot of talking and all that, but I also record about, <laughs> a little behind this here, but about a video a day right now, five to 10 minutes, which is usually the start of our content marketing engine. So I'll have an idea, I'll record a quick five, 10 minute video, first take, the background is whatever it is, no production value or anything. And then I'll take that video, which basically is my, like breaking down of a knowledge of an idea of a story, and I'll send it over to one of our guys, and he's gonna write a first very rough draft or blog post. I'm gonna work on that draft to make it a, a second one, and then that, 
video and that draft goes on and lives for a very long time. We do a lot of shit with it. So we'll post it as a blog, we'll post the video, we'll then take the, the blog after we've done a lot of blog. The book is basically a, an edited and collected version of blog posts. So after we've done enough about a subject, we'll turn it into a book, we'll turn it into an email course, we'll turn it into a presentation, a webinar, we'll take a bunch of the stuff out of the content and we'll turn it into tweets, we'll go to core and search for people that search for and then questions that were related to the video that I recorded and posted as answers. And we're going to reuse and remix the content to death. And then people come to me that know me and go, how, do you, how are you everywhere? You know, we just reuse and remix content a lot. So the one video I record every day, I don't listen to and watch every day. All of these videos, although I should. Um, the talks, I'm, I'm behind. But I, I would say that per month, I probably watch 15, 20 minutes of me talking. One of the most shocking things that happened, this is a very, so recording everything you do is very important if you want to improve as a uh, communicator, then watching it is the painful part, but the, actually the difficult part. Um, and the, the one thing that I'm working on right now, you might, uh, you might notice it now that I'm going to tell you, is that I never, I never need, so the guy, Ramin who works with me on all the content stuff, I was like, what could I do better? Because I know he watches all the videos. And he created the content. I'm like, what could I do better? I've not thought about improving anything. What could I do better? It's like, you know, you say actually a lot, but you can trim down on it. It's like, really? It's like, yeah. It's like, are you sure you watch the right videos? It's like, yeah. And I and I watched two or three videos, and then I wanted to kill myself. Like I wanted to <laughs> jump off the balcony and end this. And you know what the crazy part is? Now when I record a video. I still say it. Like I say, I say, I'll say it a lot more than I need to. And I'm working on it. I'm working on taking out actually from my from my communication. And when I do it today, one thing that you'll notice, that you might notice, when I say it, oftentimes I try to go back and say again what I said without it. I'm trying to reprogram my brain because it's fucking stupid and it says actually in every third sentence for no reason other than <laughs> lazy and stupid communication habits, right? So um, not as much, but every time I do, good things happen in the world. <laughs> uh, next question. Yes? So I have a company called Blue Board. Blue Board? Blue Board. Blue Board. All right. You said your company name right, sir. It's OK. You know, I, I'm just teasing. I totally get it. You're Canadian. I've been there. I've been there. So we help companies like Boss optimizing the board their top people. What the top is, people, the top performers. So top performers, small award winners, HR, like employees. 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 All right. So it could have been users or something else. Okay, employees. Yeah. So our so top employees. All right. Um, one of the things we well, during our sales process, one, there's like no urgency, okay. and two, the people we sell to often have to go to the VP of sales or to the CLO, the manager in HR, the head of HR, and they have to like champion our product. And one of the one of the things we're like, I'm just looking for ways to like create internal changes. Alright, so those are great questions. So one is urgency. Yeah. You said something that I want to challenge, which is like our product doesn't really have any like, kind of embedded urgency to it. Yeah. And the second part is like champions. How do you cultivate? How do you support? How do you make champions that help you sell within an organization? Let's go through both of them. Those are great questions. So the urgency one. The urgency one you'll be like. <coughs> A uh, shit ton of startups have this problem that you're selling something, especially when you do outbound, when you reach out to people, you're not a top priority that a lot of them thought about you. Even if you provide something that seems to potentially be valuable, it might not be a priority whatsoever, and you'll be around it. Right? So, or in two or in a year, so they can get around to it later. The way to create urgency for your product is to understand their priorities. That's it. Every company and every human being in a company has priorities, things that are really important to them. And by the way, when you sell your businesses, when you have multi-stakeholders buying your shit, you have to sell to every individually, every individual, individual. A lot of times people think, I'm selling to IBM, I'll go with my product and I present how my product will make IBM better. Well, that's nice, but I'm the head of HR and I don't give a fuck if this makes IBM better, if it makes my life harder. Or if it makes my life riskier, or it makes me look bad. So I have needs that are somewhat sometimes related to the overall needs of the business, but sometimes very opposing to what's the best thing for the business. 
So you're always selling to people. You never sell to an organization. And you need to understand what does this person need, your champion in this case, to be successful and be great. And then you need to know what does the VP of sales need, and you need to sell to that person differently. Now coming back to the urgency one, the first thing you need to figure out is what are what is the prospect's priorities? Right? And once you understand their priorities, let's say they say our priorities right now are to hit the quarterly numbers in terms of revenue. Cool. How far away are you from that? Like how are you tracking well? Are you behind? Like where, you, where are you on the spectrum? But we're fucking really behind. So this is like the most pressing, most stressful thing. Interesting. Right? Many companies are in the same boat. I totally feel you. I hear you. Let me ask you, what are you guys going to do to catch up? Like, what are the initiatives? What are the things that you guys are doing to catch up? Well, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. Cool. I would go much deeper on understanding this problem. And eventually, if my product can help in one way or another, like in your case, this is a stretch, but just as an example, I don't know your product well enough, but as a stretch, the way I would sell that person your product then would be to figure out how can rewarding the top people on the sales team make them hit their quarterly number. That's my pitch then. I'm gonna help you hit your number and win in your top priority, and here's how my product is gonna help you do that. Now, if the same guy told me my number one priority is we need to increase, you know, whatever, employee happiness as an example, because we have too many people churning, and our new CEO wants new initiatives, and I need to figure out some things that will make us more startup y, and like they wanna be more like a startup because people say we're not a cool place to work anymore. Boom, my pitch now is. Our product will make your employees happier, will make new recruits more likely to want to join you, will increase the culture. My pet has nothing to do with revenue. You see what I'm doing? Yeah. I want to know what is a priority, and then I want to figure out can my product hit it? Sometimes it can. If you have priorities that there's no way my product can help you with, I'm not going to sell it. That's it. I'm not going to, at least not right now, because it's not a priority. But the challenging thing is, I might sell you the priority of my like culture and all that shit. Now, if you have to go to the VP of sales, I need to help you understand what his or her priorities are, and maybe our pitch has nothing to do with the boy happiness. Our pitch now has a little bit to do with the boy happiness, but also a lot to do with like performance and sales numbers. See what I'm doing? Like, I need to understand every single buyer. I can't just come in and say this is good for the business. So everybody in this company should like this service and should want to buy it. That's not how it works. If you Learn what their priorities are. You can cut your product into that. They're going to move fast. If you don't, they're going to take all the time in the world. So you can, oh, it doesn't matter what your product is, you can always turn it into a priority if you <coughs> learn what their, theirs are and if there's a way your product or service will help them with that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let's talk about champions because it's you know, fairly related. So on the champion side, one thing is what I said, you need to understand that a person well, you need to understand the person, the department, and the company, right? The person has certain needs, the department has certain needs, the company has certain needs. Best way your product will cater to all these needs, but they can be different, right? So you need to understand that. You need to make, at all times, the simplest thing to do is to make your champion look really fucking amazing. And again, how do you do that? How do you know what will make this person look amazing in their job? It's by knowing what their priorities are, by knowing what their pressures are, by knowing what their department wants, what their boss needs, what they're struggling with. If you know these things, you can figure out how can I make this person look like a rock star, right? Um, if this person doesn't have the need to look like uh, amazing, but it's very risk averse, so all this person tries to do is optimize for not looking like an idiot, right? So now, I don't want to look like a rock star, I just don't want to look like a fucking idiot. Like, that's the thing that's a priority in my life. Now, your entire pitch needs to be about how all these very smart people have bought your product. Of buying your product will be a safe choice. Of buying your product is the most conservative thing I could do because it's going to save my job because all these other companies are going to buy it. See what I'm doing? I, and, and this is everything we did around, and you guys don't know me well enough to know this, but I don't sell to people that shouldn't buy. Where, before I do any of this, like figuring out how to cater my pitch to you, first I qualify you. First I need to figure out that I can make you successful. If I can, I will never sell to you. But once I do, I will change my pitch to make it relevant for your life. Right? So make your help your champions by understanding them. Help them by understanding who they have to sell to. Who is this person? Right? And you can, here's an easy hack. Always go 
uh, always get to the past to learn from the future. So you can go. If I, if I, if you have a champion and the person's like, I really want to do this. I'm in HR. I think this is this important thing. This is really important. Uh, I need to go to the head of marketing to get them on board with this. Then your question, the next question you have needs to be, that's awesome. Let me ask you, when was the last time you went to the head of marketing to introduce a new initiative, product, or service? Now, the next answer is very important for how quick your chances are for selling them anything, right? Because they're like, well, never, I've never gone to the, to the person in the last 10 years that I've been Then I would want to know why. Oh, how come? That's curious. Help me out. I've never heard this before. Do you guys not work very closely? Why would you feel like this is the right person to bring in first? Maybe there's somebody else that we can bring in, smaller win. If I say, oh yeah, I did this a year ago, I, you know, I was the guy that brought in this new technology thing and I got the marketing, head of marketing on board. Awesome, don't get overly excited, don't wet your pants yet. You wait for a second, take a breath, because too many people jump on that, too early, prematurely, like, oh, that's awesome, well then we should go, blah, blah, blah. and then they go back to the team and go, well, you know, this HR guy is my champion, and he's done this before, he's successfully brought them this other software, so he's gonna, our chances are amazing, we're gonna get this deal. Wait a second, let's rewind back. Oh, you've done this six months ago? That's awesome. Let me ask you, how is it going? Six months ago, you convinced the head of marketing to buy this new technology. Awesome. How is it going? Has this been a big success? And, you know, we really haven't started really using it yet. <laughs> you know, you know because the priorities change, this and this and this. That. Cool. How does everybody feel about that? How does the head of marketing feel about the, the purchase you know, of this software? Well, you know, they're, they're, you know, I mean, we've gotten a bit more selective about uh, now, you know, the last time this guy did this was a failure. So you need to know why to make sure you don't make the same mistakes, but you also need to now give him all the tools to differentiate your product from that other. Now the pitch needs to be. Well, I'm going to introduce you to this new software. Here's why it's totally different from what we did with them, those guys. And it needs to address all the problems they had with those guys. Right? If the person says, oh, when you asked them, hey, six months ago when you convinced the head of marketing to buy this thing, how did it go? And they say, oh, it's a huge success. Everybody loves it. Again, just calm down, take a breath, and go, why? That's awesome. Tell me why. Why do you think that this goes so well? What were all the steps that made this system? Now, everything you need to do is give this champion all the tools to make your product look exactly like that one. Now when they go and pitch, they're like, let me tell you how this is exactly like that. See what I'm saying? You learn from the past to close the deal in the future. You want to avoid all the shitty mistakes they made in the past, and when they make something right, you want to do exactly the same thing and associate as much as possible with success. Right? Ask these questions, learn from it, to then give your champion what they need to get to the next level. And every time you get a new person on the phone, it doesn't matter if it's the CEO or the secretary or an intern, you have to first resell them from scratch. You have to assume, oh yeah, I talked to the head of marketing. What's your name again? Hey Kevin, I talked to the head of marketing. He said, here's a few more questions. I'm going to connect you guys, you're going to talk, but you really like it. You jump on a call with it. What's your assumption? Your assumption is the guy knows what the company name is, what the company does, you talk about it, so now all you have to answer is questions. I pick up the phone, I'm like, I don't I don't know who you are. I haven't spent it. You talk about a week ago, I have a million other things going on. You can't assume that I know who you are and I like it, just because the champion said it. Whenever you talk to a new person in the business, you resell again. You resell from scratch as if they've never heard anything from you. This is actually also all you do when you come into a partner meeting except VCs. You can't come into a partner meeting, you spend like three months with this one partner from a VC firm and he loves you and you love him and this is such a great relationship. You're invited to the partner meeting on Monday, you walk into the partner meeting, there's like 10 people sitting there, you're like, they're free, they know what's going on, now they don't know fuck shit, anything about you. Right? There's two people there that are like, what the fuck is this? Uh, this is a stupid idea. And it's not that you're walking to a super educated, prepared crowd that's very eager to buy. You need to start fresh every single person in the business you're going to resell. It doesn't matter how junior they are either. The junior guys can totally derail their deal, right? I had this done twice. I sold, when I first came here, my first startup, we were two people, myself and an engineer. And I had a little bit of money, that was all our funding. 
And because this end consumer stuff with my education platform wasn't working, I shipped it to the enterprise cloud for a year. Think about this. There's this guy with a broken English accent, with no background in enterprise whatsoever, with this very talented but very, very junior engineer. Otherwise, how could I have attracted that person to come work with me? We're like a two-person unfunded team going for enterprise sales, right? And I go to, I go to Google, Intuit, SAP, and Oracle. My first four meetings, and direct, directors and VPs, all four meetings, I get a, we're going to do this. This is amazing. We're going to do a pilot. You know what my reaction was? This shit is easy. And everybody was warning me about enterprise sales. Either I'm that great, which is probably part of the factory, but also, this is not that hard. Like, I'm like a nobody, and I got the biggest technology company in Silicon Valley. I said, yes, this is amazing. I'll give you the example of Google. The director of engin uh, engineering education at Google said, yes. She became an advisor, joined my advisory board of my business. Like, amazing relationship. Like, she signed up on a pilot to, to have all the engineers at Google teaching something from each other using my platform. I'm like, all right, this is it. I'm giving you the money, I'm giving you the platform, I'm delivering the stuff, and now you guys go and turn it into success. She now takes this and hands it off to some junior project manager. That person, although she was really nice, didn't give two shits about what we were doing, didn't know anything about it, was not bought in. I never sold her on the vision or anything. And she did a terrible job rolling out that pilot because she truly didn't care. She had a ton of other things on their plate. This was some side project of the big director, and she was like, all right, cool, I'll do it. She did nothing to make this a success, and I did nothing to help her make this a success. And then it was a failure. So here I am, I invest four or five months, and the pilot is a failure, and they don't do Right? I can't overstate how many times you'll get the top guy, the CEO, to be like, I want to buy your software, your software is awesome, let me connect you with my you know, enter title of somebody who's actually doing work, actually. Enter title who's for somebody who's doing work, real work, maybe a better way of saying it than actually, doing real work. That person, like every week, the CEO sends me some shitty thing I should check out, of a million other things. That person's not going to be excited just because the CEO wanted this. Except if the CEO says, I'm going to make this the one, one or two priorities that I champion every year, this is going to be one of them. That's a different day. Usually that's not what happens. So you need to understand, we sell everything. You need to understand the priorities of the people. You need to understand their needs. You need to help them win other people over and learn from the past. Have they done this before? If so, with whom and why did it work or didn't it work? And then you need to understand that you need to resell every single thing. Whoever it is, the intern, the secretary, the person that opens the door, the cleaning lady, every person you interact with that company, you will resell them on why your product is amazing, why they should care. And you want to learn what they need and what they care about. All right? Excellent question. All right, uh, next question. Oh, there you go. Okay, so this is a question which I'm sure deserves a long answer, so I hope you have no plans for the evening. <laughs> so, what's the best way to uh, build a sales team? Like, initially, the founders can maybe do the first sales themselves. What's next? Like, hire a senior VP, hire a it's a great question. Before I answer it, I'll put you on the spot. So this guy he is a really awesome investor. Uh, was one of the first investors in Zendesk. Just to give you guys some, some context. An awesome SaaS guy. You should read his blog. So now that I got a lot of attention on you, everybody's like, I'm going to talk to this guy. When can Sally stop talking so I can get some money from my startup? Now that I've done that, uh, let me answer your question. All right, so for people, they can't clearly think anymore. The question was, like, how do you build and scale up the sales team when you start from nothing? That's an excellent question. So here's my answer. And, and there you go. This is mine now. So um, I'll take it if you want to. Um, so how do you build sales teams? What are the different stages? So here's the way that I think about this. Um, Stage number one, founders need to do sales. It, and I don't care if you're the most uncharismatic, unsalesy person in the universe. I don't care if you, you know, whatever it is, like if you have a speech impediment, if you just like, whatever it is, right, you need to sell. Um, but I'm going to do a horrible job. Who cares? Do it anyways. You need to sell yourself first, right? There's no way around that. There's no way around that. And founders love to want a way around that. 
They're like, well, the tiresome steel guy and do this for us. So first you sell yourself. And, that, and this is not just so you do amazing, it's also so you understand your customers, customer development, you understand their problems, you understand the salespeople you hire better because you've done the job before. You'll get market insight that nobody else, you can't get secondhand insights. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as hiring somebody and say, go to my customers and not just try to sell them, but if they say something that makes you come up with an idea of how we could shift our product to arrive to product market fit and become a billion dollar business, let me know. Like they, that's not, they're not going to be capable of doing that. When you talk to people and they tell you what really sucks about your solution, what they really care about in their lives, you hear that again and again and again, you have all the context in the world, you'll have these insights that are invaluable in the early days. You need to do sales first. That's stage one. Now let's say you do a little bit of sales, it's kind of working, you have a few customers, it's going well, but now you're like, oh, I'm a bottleneck in this business, right? And it's like, all right, I've been doing this for a few months now, we're winning some customers, but we need to accelerate. We need to move faster. What do you know, founders want to do then? Let's now go and hire really senior people, right? Very, very, very bad idea, right? So, and, I, and I'll come back to why you shouldn't hire a senior salesperson at the end of, of, of this. So, first stage, you do it yourself. What should you do in the second stage? Bring in junior talent. You bring in junior talent, and you now. You as a founder, you graduated from you know, junior salesperson yourself to now you're a junior sales manager. That's who you are. Now, you're still doing most of the sales, but now you have like two or three junior guys that just do the groundwork at the top of the funnel to get more work, get more deals, get more demos, get more stuff done. What, what you're doing in this space is something else. First, you're learning a little bit about like sales management, but even more importantly, you learn can what I do, can I teach to anyone else to do the same thing? Is what I do in any way, in any shape, form, or way, repeatable? If you can't teach any of your successes to anybody else, you have a problem. There's a problem here, and the senior guy is not going to fix that. So, first stage, you do sales yourself. Second stage, you hire a junior talent. Hungry, talented, cheap, right? In easy supply, that's what you're looking for. You bring them in. They're going to force you to make sales a higher priority, right? Up until this point, you were like 50% of product visionary with 50% sales. Now you have like two people looking at you. Like, what should we do next, boss? And like, uh, now sales is a much bigger priority. All of a sudden, it's your full-time job. And now you see, can I teach somebody else to get some level of what I've accomplished? Can they repeat some of these results? Once you go through that hurdle, and they, you, they were able to generate some of the same results, stage two, now what you're doing in stage three, now we're surely hiring the VP of sales, right? No fucking way, right? It's too early. What you do now in stage number three is, so you went from junior salesperson yourself to junior sales manager. Now you're gonna bring in a real junior sales manager. And what you're gonna look for is, you're gonna go, well, I have like three salespeople and myself, this was the sales team in this stage number two. What I'm gonna do now is gonna, I'm gonna look for a, a, a sales person that was one of the early sales guys of a company like us two years ago. He became a sales manager and managed a team of five or eight people. You're gonna hire that guy or gal. And you're gonna bring them in and that person is gonna take all the lessons learned at this other business and apply them immediately to yours and bring immediate value. They'll take the little bit of a team that you've built, a little bit of a process, and have easy wins, left and right, and improving. Boom, 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 because they've, they've just went through that exercise two years ago of going from these two to eight, so they'll come back and they're like, I know what not to do, what to do. I have like two guys from over there, we're gonna hire over here. Immediate value, right? So that person now takes what you build, that little bit of thing, and improves on it. And grows it a little bit. Now, you've proven that you're not, you can't just teach somebody to do the sales job you've done. You've now been able to have somebody else become the sales leader that you were. Right? They need to be better than that. And at this stage, now we're talking stage number four, that's when you bring in a senior sales leader. Because that guy or gal, they'll come in, and now you have like 10 salespeople and a sales manager, and something is running, they'll come in and they'll be, I know how to take this and multiply it by 100. I know how to hire people from all offices. I know how to rework your compensation structure, your commission structure. I know how to build a training program and a hiring program. Like they'll come in and they'll build They'll take what you've done and they'll scale it up. And if you do the right steps at the right stages, you're gonna kill it. 
here's why most people fail in development. One is like a selfish thing. We as human beings, we don't want to do things we don't want to do. And uh, for most startup founders, sales is not something we want to do. Sales management is not something we want to do. So we just want to outsource it to somebody who's going to come in and do all this. The problem is, let's go back to why you shouldn't hire a senior VP of sales or a senior sales executive. That's also something that you all the time like, a company that does enterprise sales, they'll say, well, <coughs> we have no experience in sales. But we found this candidate, and this guy has 40 years of experience. He has a Rolodex around the globe. He has all these customers. If he comes in, he's going to just close all these customers for us, and we're going to be fucking killing it. If you, if you, with your shitty little startup, and you're like one and a half customers that are paying almost no real money for it, if you can hire a killer sales executive with 40 years of experience, like, this is like saying, I don't know, but this is like saying you're gonna, you know, you're the next Steve Jobs. Odds are very against you, it's not impossible, but it's improbable. It's, it's the reason why I don't play lottery, because I don't believe in the odds. Like, there's just no fucking way, if somebody's really good, here's the problem, if, if somebody's really senior and appears really good to you, and is willing to come, they're the worst kind of salesman. Right? They're the worst kind. They're the sales, they're the type of salesperson that is good enough selling themselves to people who don't know shit about sales. That's how they make their living. Because they don't know how to sell. Because if you know how to, here's the thing, guys, if you are good at sales, and you've been in sales for a while, you're killing it. You are killing, you're making a shit ton of money. There's sales people that make half a million, a million, two million. I mean, there's industries where a single salesperson might make 15 million a year in income. But let's not talk about these, like, even our just average, really good seniors, okay, it's gonna be 250, 300, 400,000 dollars a year. Right, and he has this really good, cushy job, his kids, his house, his wife. Why should he, because your startup is special. I know, that's your, your answer. Like, I already know, why should he join me? Because my startup is really special. There's an exception. If it's your brother, your sister, or your mom or dad, it's an exception, I them, right? They might come because they really, really know you well. But if it's just some, Guy that applied to your Craigslist post? This is another thing. Salespeople that are good are not on Craigslist looking for jobs. They're not. Now, it's different for junior salespeople that have never had a sales job and write off calls. It's a different crowd. But a senior, successful salesperson applying to your job from a job board, that thing does not exist. That thing does not exist. <coughs> run. When you need a person like that, run. That's the only action you should Fucking run. This person's gonna destroy your company. Here's why. First of all, you're gonna oversell themselves and get a lot more money than you wanted. Now they're gonna sell you like my salary is three hundred thousand right now, and I'm gonna come and only work for a hundred thousand. You're like, fucking god, we're all just making and we we don't pay anyone a hundred thousand. But you'll think, well, but he has this Rolodex, and then the nine if he just brings in, you know, you know, fifty of his hundred companies that can easily close for us. It's gonna be 10 million in revenue, so all right, we'll pay my Mistake number one. Mistake number two, this person is gonna educate you on all the wrong things about sales. He's gonna give you talks and speech. He's gonna be in the business of selling you on him being great at sales. So he's gonna be telling you what's wrong with your product, how to do sales, how relationships have to be. He's gonna be giving you a horrible education, teaching you that, you know, whatever, that, you know, that the earth is flat. That's your education, that's the, you're gonna learn all the wrong things. And then they're gonna fuck around and waste as much time as you give them. They're gonna max out on just spending as much time being employed to getting a salary without showing results. And they're gonna have really good arguments for it and you will feel like, that's not compute for me. It's like when you're a sales guy and you talk to an engineer and the engineer says, well, these are the reasons why we can't make it. And you're like, this does not compute for me, but I don't have good arguments against it. So I just guess I'll say yes. You know, and six, nine months later, you have to fire that person who wasted so much time, so much energy, the person who was like walking around creating bad brand image for your business and is gonna like just kill your business. So you can't get senior talent super early and in a very available and easy fashion. It's usually not what it was. Now there's always exceptions, as I said, right? But but you wanna hire the, the the thing is a senior sales leader, the VP of sales type. These people are good at certain things. They are not necessarily selling themselves. They're good at training people, hiring, setting up an infrastructure, compensation plans. They're, they're great at coming when there's a foundation and building a really high building. They're not necessarily great at like 
doing the foundation work themselves. That's your job. So um, those are the stages. First, you do sales yourself as a founder. You have junior talent, and you manage them as a founder. Then you bring in junior management talent, and you have them take over your job. And bring in the easy wins they learned the hard way somewhere else. Right? You benefit from that. And then you bring in somebody that takes that foundation and scales it. All right, awesome. Next question. Yes. Do you think I'm best in the sense of the YouTubers or experts or like, are you getting the same size that or how do you, I mean, you have to look at the individual, as you said. I mean, uh, if, I, if I think of like the US uh, sales guys who are like, talking, 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 and uh, for you, this is the next approaching. Yeah, so the question is like, what are different sales types? What is effective, what is not? How much do you customize? Like, in Germany, people sell differently, want to buy differently than in the US, and all that, that stuff. So I think it's a great question. I think that overall, people have the wrong idea of what great sales is. So I, I talk about this a lot. To me, a great salesperson, especially a great salesperson in a startup, is in the uh, friendly strength quadrant. So there's a quadrant, if you think about it, and you have people that are strong and hostile, and you have people that are strong and friendly, and you have people that are weak and hostile, and then you have people that are weak and friendly. Right? If you think about the strong and hostile type personality, that's the wolf of Wall Street. That's the guy that's out there to kill the customer, right? To like destroy everybody, crush it. I had somebody send me an email today and was like, Seth, I wanted to introduce you to this killer. He's a killer, you're a killer, you guys should kill it together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> sure, like, I don't know. Okay. Um, so these are the, 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 they do well in life to a certain degree in sales because they're strong. And they go out there and they find weak people, they push them their way, right? And they go out there and they kill people and push them, and you know, they get their way, but always in a very short period type of way, usually, because none of the people that they push wants to be pushed forever and stick around to enjoy their whole life, right? So they, they rely on a type of environment where they go, they kill, but they have to keep going to find new things to kill. Um, so that's not necessarily the type of salesperson you want to hire, because that's not going to work for you. You, the other opposite is the friendly and weak. You would think that the friendly and weak are the nicest people, the most popular people on this planet. Unfortunately, they're the most mistreated, horrible victim people around there. When you put a friendly and weak person in a room with anyone else, they'll meet, they'll, you start treating them really badly. Right? Just human psychology, something in, in them, the way they treat you, triggers you that this is a victim and I need to take advantage of it. I'm annoyed by it. Well, this guy doesn't know what he's doing, but I want to apply for that. Right? So, so this is like, this is the, this is the, no, I'm a whatever, arts teacher, you know, and this like, back to school program, is super nice, calm, good, golden heart, but it was like apologetic that they exist and they have to talk to you. That's not going to work either. Nobody wants to buy from these people. The ideal model is friendly and strong. What that means is that I, when I sell, I want people to win. I want them to succeed. I only want to close you if you're the right customer. But I'm going to tell them what you do. Once I'm convinced that you should buy my software, I'm not going to have a debate about it. I'm going to tell you what you do. Because I know better than you, right? And the best model for me to think of that, and I use this a lot, is like being a good parent. So being a good parent, like kids go fucking nuts when they're like tired, sleepy, hungry, uh, or sick, as I've experienced lately. Um, and what that means is that a perfectly normal, well-educated child that's really nice will turn into a fucking monster. Like, monster, right? They'll go nuts. And they'll do everything they, they'll, they'll instinctively know what annoys you most, that's what they're going to do, right? So, they come into the room, and this kid is running around, and he's like, ah, and throwing things at you. And like, and then you don't believe your kid is totally nice. And they're like, oh, nuts and crazy. I hate you. Up. When that happens, you can't get involved as a parent, like that, but a good parent. You're not like, are you crazy? I hate you more than you hate me. Right? After all I've done for you, you suck, you ungrateful piece of shit, one year old baby. Right? Like, I, this is harsh, but I'm a lovely father, don't worry. This is just, that's not how I talk about it. But you won't be like, you don't get all involved. As a good parent, you're like, all right, I realize you're tired and hungry. I totally get it. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to put you in your pajamas, we're going to read the story, and then you're going to sleep after you drink your own milk. All right? No, no! You pick the child up. This is not a debate. I'm not having a debate with ah! you. put the pajamas on. Ah! And eventually, the child stops and goes, all right, fuck it. I guess we'll, I guess we'll go to the plan. They go totally quiet. 
eventually, just your determination, your clarity makes them give in. Right, right. That's what we're doing. So let me back to the story we had here. Uh, it's about the champion. And yeah. It's, and it's about like, uh, getting, uh, getting uh, the sales numbers up. And uh, what is uh, in the HR software. And we'll tell them, okay, I know you have this problem. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and put it in the software. I'm going to put it in the software. Yeah, no, so the, the thing is that I'll give you an example if I related to kids. We'll have one more story about kids that I'll tell you just because I want to. So, no, I'll get to that, that back in the But here's the, point, here's the point of how you're friendly and strong. Once I qualify you, and I don't qualify, and we've been doing this, we've been talking about this, I don't qualify like this. Hey, let me, I have a few questions to see if it would be a good service for you guys. How many salespeople do you have? Three, okay, cool. Um, and then what's your sales process? Well, we start doing a lot of calls. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, so it sounds like uh, something would be a perfect fit for you. <laughs> That's not what I mean, right? I don't know shit. I obviously didn't pay attention. But once I take the time to go deep, challenge your what you're telling me, truly go deep and understand it, then I'm like, all right, we're the right fit, here's why, here's what we're going to do next. Well, but I'm a little unsure. Cool. Most people aren't sure at this point. You know, I've done this many, many times with good hands. I'll tell you how to go from unsure to sure. Here's what we're going to do next. I'm not affected by this. I'll pick up the phone and somebody go, a customer is really upset. Or, or what happened uh, recently was, uh, you know, we would be, one of my sales guys was working on this deal for really longer than we usually do, and invested in this deal very long and did jump through all the hoops. And then in the last second, they talked about pricing many, many times. And the guy goes all outraged that he's not getting a bigger discount. Oh, this is outrageous. I bought all this software with this big business. You know, nobody in blah, blah, Everybody else gives us a bit of a good deal. Why? And he's, my son's guy, this guy turned from like nice to like screaming at me. What the fuck? Like, let's talk to him. You know, when I picked up the phone and called him, I was like, all right, so you hear you're a little upset about the pricing of this. What's the problem? I was well, dude, you guys don't know what you're doing. So blah, blah, blah. This is not saying a lot about what you think. I let him do this routine, and then I'm saying, all right, so I totally get that you're upset. I I, I, even, I know where you're coming from. My bad. You know what, why I like you so much? My best customers will be angriest customers at exactly this point. So here's what's going to happen next. Let's step back and reevaluate the value we create versus the cost of the software. And if the cost is higher than the value, if we have to give you a bigger discount with the value higher than the cost, I'm not going to sell you my software today. I'm going to send you to somebody else. That's as simple as that. But let's reevaluate why the value is higher than the cost. And if, if that math doesn't check out, let's not do the deal. It's like, well, well but, um, you know, I, what it comes down to is like, we've used you, but we also checked this competitor of yours, and they're giving us this quote. And I like you, you know, I, mean, I like you, but also like them, you have some strengths, but some weaknesses, they have some strengths and some weaknesses. I'm telling you right now, Stelly, if you can match the price that they gave us, We'll go with you. If not, we're going with them. Like, All right, that's fair. Let me ask you something. You've been trialing our software for a really long time. Why? Why didn't you just buy that software if, if those guys gave you that quote? Well, you know, I like your thing because of this and this and this and that. Cool. What do you like about them? That and that and that and that. If you take these three things here and these three things there, what's more valuable to you? And why? And at the end of the conversation, I, I told them, listen, if price is the main thing how you're going to buy the software, I don't want your business. But I'm going to be helpful to you. I'm going to help you get an even better price from them. I'm more than happy to give you a quote that's like five dollars. You can take that email and go and get a better deal. Let's work. Let's collaborate on this. But I want you to buy my software because it's the better software, not the better price. If that's what you want, I'm not interested in that type of uh, customer. But if that's what you want, I'll help you. No, well, blah, 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 and this and this. And we ended up, and he's like, well, just send me. Funny enough, he was in the, in the room visiting when I had this call with this guy. And he says, well, just send me a quote. Just send me the best you can do. I'm like, dude, I can tell you right now, you're not going to like that email. Because the number is exactly the same number as I just told you. <laughs> I mean, if you want to read it, I'll write it, but it won't be different. Right? My English is not that bad. Like, it's going to be the exact same number. You're telling me that the number is impossible. I'll send you an email to you know, satisfy that email. You're not going to like it. It's like, well, I don't know. Send it anyways. I sent it. And I didn't think he was totally going to buy it. I crushed it. No, he's like, he's buying, buying. He's not buying, he's not buying. Right? And he bought. <coughs> but not all will. But this is a, a type of interaction. You know, am I a little arrogant? Am I, depends how you want to look at it. But my point is, like, I'm not going to be pushed around by you. There's sometimes 
some people tell me, well, if I have to qualify a, a prospect, I'm on the phone with them, and I ask them these questions, sometimes somebody, sometimes, uh, a few weeks ago, somebody was like, you know, I have this guy, and I asked the question, and the guy goes, I'm not here to answer your questions. Here's how we buy software. I'm going to ask the questions. You're going to give me the answers, and then I will decide if I want to buy them. What do I say in this situation? No. No. Here's what you say. You say, you know what? I totally get that that's the way that you typically buy. And this is a normal customer buyer relationship. I'm not interested in normal customer buyer relationships. I'm interested in partnerships. The only way that I can be a partner is if I truly understand you and I can go beyond just servicing you something but really make this special. That's not the way you want to sell. So although I know that typically that's the way you buy, I think that's the right way to go. In this case, we will need to make an exception to make this exception. Yes or no? Well, no. Well, then go fuck off, right? I don't. I'm not forced to sell my software to everybody. So in terms of like customizing, I don't think you, I think you need to be authentic. I don't think that you need to be a certain type of person. There's engineers. I, what I've learned working with engineers really closely is that engineers have certain traits that are gold in sales. For instance, asking questions and not just taking any word on the surface as the answer. What do you guys really need? Marketing automation. The sales guy will go, awesome, we do have that. Well, it seems like you're a perfect fit. An engineer will go, what do you mean with marketing automation? Well, you know, we're sending lots of emails to lots of people. Um, like a newsletter, and tell me a little bit more about it. Oh, that, that, that. All right, but then how do you implement it? Gonna, like, an engineer will try to really understand what the situation is. You know, like when a sales go, guy goes to a sales the engineer and says, the customer really needs this, can we do this? He's like, why, how, when, what does this really mean? The sales guy, I don't know, I'm going to have to go back and ask again. Right? So engineers are amazing at like, not just taking any fucking answer, interpreting it in as like, this is easy money, and being excited and being in the Those are like, I don't understand marketing automation. It's not enough information for me to compute. Right? It doesn't parse. There's no results to this. Like, I need more information. So that's awesome in sales. You know, I don't ask all the right questions. You make them paint you the target in detail. And then if you have that level of understanding, you throw one dart, you hit. The sales being salesy is the guy that's like, well, we're this way and that way, we offer this and we're going to make more revenue and less debt, and blah, 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 blah. This is the, the, the guy that threw darts in the dark and hopes something, something will kill the guy, that something will stick. That's super ineffective. So engineers can be really good. Introverts can be really good at sales. If you're an introvert that can communicate, that cares, that can fall off, that can go for the calls, like, you don't have to be a certain personality type. You can be really authentic. Um, but you truly have to care, and you truly have to understand the other side. And if you really understand the other side, yeah, you want to customize what you say. Like, not to the degree where it's a lie, where it's a lie, but to the degree where, it not, where you're not talking about the benefit they care about versus the features you have. All right. Yes? What are you on the market market right now? What was I? Well, yeah. Two years. Two years. What is your channel like? Because you're interested in uh, partnerships and how <coughs> like normal sales when people are just selling to and they don't care, and you are interested in partnerships, how does it look like with, with churn rate? Yeah, that's a great question. So it, it depends, because there is, you know, there's going to be some channels where we have self sign up very small customers that run out of business. Right? There's nothing that you can do there. On the bigger businesses, our customers stick around for a very long time. They sign two, three-year contracts, and we usually have a really good relationship. In the case where at some point we won't be able to service a customer, we had this recently where one customer we weren't able to service anymore that well, but they're still on contract, we'll let them out of the contract. Let them out of the contract to help them be successful with whatever they do later on. But do you think that, that it has an impact on this churn rate? I don't give a shit. Okay. Honestly, I don't do this to decrease churn necessarily. I do this to make my life better. Because if I sell to successful customers, I'll have less support problems, I have less people that run around telling everybody that I suck, and less people calling me telling me that I suck. Um, and life is just much better. Like, I love to be loved. I love to have customers send me emails and tell me how awesome I am and how great our product is and how amazing our support is. Like, that's what I want to hear all day long. I think that selling to the right customer doesn't just improve churn rates, it makes for accounts growing in revenue, it makes for more market, for cheaper marketing. It makes for better karma in the universe, and it makes for a better quality of life, which is what I care about. So it's not like too strategic on like, 
I'm gonna just do the right thing to get this out of it. I'll do it because it's good for everything. Like, it just makes my life a lot better. Hi, next question. Yes, uh, I um, is it like three versus style with like outside and inside sales, or is it like three versus gear, like, you know, like people inside of It's really it's very much focused on the right now. Okay. If you sell yeah. through phone, yeah. email, you know, yeah. we're the best tool in the world. If you are going out and you if you have a meeting in person once in a while, it's still gonna work. But if you're like out there and you're going door to door or you're going like restaurant to restaurant, you're really a field sales force, it's right, next question. Yeah, yeah. You guys are easy. All right. Man. All right. How do you tell if someone's going to be a good salesperson? How quickly can you find out what you look for when you ask them what they're doing? So uh, I was sharing with a uh, with a friend of mine earlier today about the thing, and, and the, the tweetable quote that came out of it was the great thing about hiring junior salespeople is that they fire themselves if they don't work out. Like the, the, I, I asked him, hey, they, those guys went from like ten people to fifty people in like six months on the sales floor. And I'm like, all right, so how do you hire these super junior guys and make them productive? What's the first month goal? It's like, the first month, I just want to see that this person can consistently suck because that's what they're going to do. They're going to be really bad at this. And they don't slow down. They keep picking up the phone, calling the next lead, and they don't fire themselves. They can do 30 days of keeping the pace, selling, 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 although they suck, and although they get really bad feedback, and they're still around, check first benchmark. Right? The second month now, I want to see how much can they improve, can I get them to a point where they're productive, where they're profitable. But this first point is can they like not go through it. So overall, when it comes to like uh, hiring salespeople, the thing is this, there's lots of questions that you can ask, but it's like asking me how, what interview question should I ask someone to know if they're good at basketball? I don't fucking know. I think it's not how it works. Right? I mean, you, make, you can ask some questions to a basketball player to know the character is like, what they care about, how intelligent they are, all, but not how good they are in basketball. You have to throw them the ball. So in the, the interview question, well, somebody has to pick someone. Like, and we have people, I have candidates, and I can tell in an interview setting, I cannot tell if you're going to be good at sales or not. I had a candidate once that was like, I was like the entire time interviewing that guy, I was like, Jack, hot, Jack, hot. This is going to be my future. I'm, not, I'm never going to let go of this guy again. This guy is incredible. In, and then in our sales process, first day, what you have to do is you like you interview through a couple of people and actually you come to me, you interview with me. And then what we'll do is you're going to be you know, in a sales room like this, everybody's on the phone and you get a heads on the phone and you have to do a few calls. And then you have to turn around and pitch me and I'll pitch you. And he had the worst, like, hit the worst. The guy completely, he started like shaking and twitching. He's like, at, like the entire rest of the time, I was like, calm down, it's all good. This is a stressful situation. Like, Jesus Christ, this guy went from superstar to like, he could not handle the, I'm making a phone call in front of everybody and I'm pitching. He was amazing at interview. He had perfected the art of being incredible at the interview. He could, he could throw a ball. So, how do you know if somebody's good at sales? They have to sell. But that's not enough. The, different, the, the thing that makes sales so hard to evaluate for is that somebody could be amazing at that first phone call, and I have this too. Like a guy comes in and makes a really great fucking sales call. Just because somebody is good at throwing the hoop once doesn't mean they'll bring it every day. This is the hardest thing about sales, consistency. That was, that's what makes Michael Jordan Michael Jordan is that you want all the rings, you're the best basketball star in the universe, and you still show up tonight and you have to play and score zero, zero. It's not Jordan plus 40 points for legacy and being important in the school. No, it's zero. And you have to compete tonight. Well, but this morning I had a really bad fight with my wife. Who gives a shit? Play. Well, but my dad just left. Who gives a fuck? Play and perform every single day. You don't care how you feel. That's the really, that what makes people being more okay at sales to being amazing at sales. Is can they bring consistency? That's another thing you can't know if you don't work with them for a while. So first, get throw them a ball and have them do sales. And then second, you always have to have an open mind about potentially, I never say today, I, I hire a great salesperson. You'll never hear me say that. Because I don't know. If I have worked with you for three months, I don't know. You might be, you, I, for most of my life, 
for most of my life, I was a pretty inconsistent guy, a uh, very inconsistent self guy. So I had like weeks of brilliance, crushing it, then I had weeks of nothing, like I just being like a bad, you know, canceling all my meetings, canceling everything, like not delivering on what I promised, just having really shitty low periods, and then again I would have a high. My highs were slightly higher than my lows, so I would rationalize and say, well, you know, I can afford the lows because I'm so amazing of a rock star. Right, so, but I also always felt bad about myself. I always felt like I'm not doing well enough. I was, for the longest time in my life, not really consistent. That's why I'm where I am today and not where I could be. Right? So in sales, if you have somebody that's really charismatic, really great, and is amazing at sales, and they're consistent, that's it. Jim that never let them go. Never again in your life let them go. But this person is going to be worth hundreds of millions generating a lot of it. This is golden goose, right? So, but these people are very, very rare. Most people in sales, most people that are having a sales career, they're inconsistently good. Inconsistently good. Right? That's what most people are. All right? You guys are, I'm wary you guys are. You're so This is the guy, so, so Flavio, just to give you guys comments, Flavio's a really good friend of mine. Flavio has been an entrepreneur so long, and whole time. I'm like, no, pretty much yeah, I'm 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 like I'm like something. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and we're really good friends. And this month, Flavio is doing a hustle farm at Polda. So basically, Flavio is helping all kinds of different startups. But this month, he said no to a bunch of like consulting gigs and said, because we, we were at a talk together, he was like, oh, sales thing is really awesome. I want to learn more about it. I was like, let's do a hustle farm. You come, you do sales for Polda for one month. I'm going to work together, I'm going to coach you, you're going to help me out with some marketing and some other things that we do. That's what we're doing. From the way here, we're doing sales calls. And I, would, I would have Fabio give me sales calls, we would do mock calls, I would give him feedback. <laughs> so here's the guy that listened to me for an hour and a half before we arrived here. He's like, I have more no questions. <laughs> <laughs> I have questions. So. How do you do comp? How do you do base, commission? How do you do, like, anything about that? Um, you know, yeah, so I, I don't think I'm like, Brilliant in answering this. I think that philosophically, here's the thing: like when you're further down the line, there's no rocket science anymore involved. There's pretty much standards. The VP of sales that's gonna come in knows what the standards are. They're gonna set the structure up. It's gonna just work. When you're really early, it makes no sense for you to worry about fucking compensation structures. It doesn't, right? You don't know if you're gonna be a gaming company tomorrow from your, you know, being a medical analytics company today. Like, why? Don't try to like come up with a comp structure. Just like hire a bunch of people and go, well, this is a startup, we're gonna go to the ground floor, we're gonna develop the role you're working at, and you're gonna have a say at that. That's the value you're getting. So maybe everybody gets a base salary, or if you say I can't afford paying people a base salary and I want to have everybody on commission, then you need to be cool with marketing and rolling with that. You go in and you say, this is my made up commission structure. I think somebody should be able to close 100 deals and I'll pay you this box and it's going to be this amount of money and then after a month after you say that's not feasible, you have to let go of everyone and then you have to hire a new bunch of people that still will believe you and yeah. say, this is a new comp structure, it's 50 deals a month. <laughs> and that's what you do, you just trial and error get it. Um, usually at startup, I think it's good to not have people worry about their jobs while they're at work. Um, but it's good to have a little bit of a carrot, a little bit of a, like, because good salespeople are competitive, they want to win, they want to have the scorebook, they want to be Michael Jordan in their field, they want to have that, like, they want to know they're better than others. So, what you can do is you can have, like, a simple bonus structure where it's like, if this quarter, so people don't check daily, like, have I done my, you know, $233 I need to buy my block? Like, if people do compensation that all day long while they're at work, they're not working. Right, they're fucking around. So you want to do something as simple as they need to come. Once a quarter, if we hit this number, you get a bonus. Right? Everybody gets a bonus and you might get different levels of bonuses, but you make it simple. So everybody's aligned, everybody's excited. Hey, if I get this and this done in these three months, I'll get an extra paycheck to go out and party or buy these shoes or whatever I want. So, so the biggest question is how important is the variable part? Is it just making it more variable, making it more or is it more care approach? Is it unique? Like so, yeah, so having a barrel part will make people, will, well, will make people focus more on whatever you're compensating them on, right? right? So if you're compensating them on closed deals, you might get them to close more deals, but they might close a lot of shitty deals, right. because that's what you're paying them for. You're telling them, this money does not care 
who you are getting money from. So we'll get money from anyone and everyone they can to get as much of that money as possible. That's the, so you give them money for other things, they'll do other things. So a good comp structure is a little bit of a complex thing. That's why you don't want to do it in the early days. Right? You want to do it in imperfect comp structure. The other thing with sales or competition structures or anything, it's crazy like when it comes to products, we all know as startup people that you won't get it perfect you know, in a laboratory and then go out and it just works. But when it comes to anything sales related, people want to do that. Their founders are like, well, I should have been hiring salespeople study for the last six months, but I'm still working on the compensation structure and the sales documentation before I can go out and hire people. That's the wrong way to do it. Go out there, hire some people, then figure out the stuff, and then you'll have to iterate. You'll have to prove, you have to fix. And in the process, you'll make mistakes, and you need to be okay with that. Otherwise, you're never going to get there. So, comp structure is a complex thing, but not so much. The don't worry about that. Just do something, whatever works for you, and then change it when you figure out what doesn't work about it. Uh, I have more questions. Yeah, like the compensation, you like to leave in my giving. Like, early salespeople would come on, like, it's getting the game. Like, hey, like, it's not that, like, like, I'm a salesperson, it's like, that drives me, like, I want to make this a fucking million dollar company. Like, and, like, I mean, I hired a guy away from, like, my competitor. You know, like, you know, whatever. It's like, okay, hey, you're going to come work for me, and, like, we're going to shut these fuckers down. And he's like, well, yes. Yeah, let's do it. Let's kill them. <laughs> no, that, no, I don't know. I mean, that, that is an answer in joke because it, 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 it says that you're like, you know, hostile, but, I, but it's not really that. You're not hostile because of this. No, no, I mean, I'm not hostile. So, like, that's like sort of funny that you that. But, but when I like position my business, I definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah and it, it incites people. Like, oh, we, we're mad. We like to kill things like that. Nothing wrong about that. Like, well, just to get someone to like, I'm like, oh, fuck, this is a big opportunity. Like, when I'm closing a customer, I'm like, from the guy who's like, oh yeah, like, let me just like twist, like, we're, we're going to close this deal. I love how you like, you have portrayed all the cliches that like engineers are <laughs> like, like, scared about salespeople. So, yeah. right, so let's get back to the question. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So, the question is uh, equity. Yeah, yeah. You give, do you give people equity, how much equity do you give? I don't know, it depends. So, it very much depends. Like, how early is it? Uh, how important is this salesperson? Business, my assumption is they're not that important. If you're like, if you are an ex SAP executive enterprise guy and you saw this, you take a team out from that group and you're doing an enterprise SAP like startup and you live in a completely different planet than most startups do in the way that you build team and group. Yeah, there's a different discussion. But when you're like, let's get some sales people doing my SAP sale or a few thousand bucks a month or whatever it is, yeah, I mean. It depends on the culture. Like, of course, having equity in a stake of the game can be hugely motivating for people and feeling that ownership. But usually, most of these people care a lot more about the scoreboard and the money now than the uh, like a stake. I think it's a nice to have, but comparing the two people, salespeople tend to care more about the money than about the equity. Um, and you might want to not be as heavy-handed on the equity of salespeople, especially if you're in the early stage where you might have to let go everybody. You might have to hire completely different salespeople. You're still like figuring this out. You want to hire a bunch of junior sales guys giving them good, good equity. So I don't have a perfect answer to this. It depends, I guess, is my answer. Depends. depends on what you want to do, what kind of people they are, how important they are, all that. Um, yeah. Any more questions? I'm going to be here until you can ask yeah, a question. Right. And I feel like winning. Like, I've won with you. Like, <laughs> we're out of fucking. Just get this guy to leave already. We're tired. All right. You're like, no, I'm not going to do that. You're not going to See, all I have to do is challenge you guys. So like, all right, I have questions. All right. How do you set that quota for yourself? How do you set quota? I mean, it could be in, like, two, in, in, this, in this level that you are a founder and you are selling your products, and then you are hiring this, this junior, junior talent. Yeah. And when to set up the quota and how to do it? I mean, there's, there, so there's two, yeah, there's two things. It's very simple. This is not hard. You base it either on reality of your performance of what you've seen achievable, or you base it on the, uh, you know, the, the, the hallucination of what you want people to achieve. But it hasn't been proven, you haven't done it yourself. And, and those are your two options and everything in between. So you can go, you know, I just want people to do what I do, that's the quarter. And you can always change the quota later when you learn how to do things better. Or you can go, I want them to do what I do plus 30%. Okay, but should, should I expect uh, them to do better, those junior talents? 
It depends. I mean, the, the answer is yes or no, because the no part is they're not the founders. They don't have that title. They don't have that knowledge. But the yes part is they might have more awesome than you. They might be better communicators. They might, your company is now six months more mature and it's more customers. So they have that benefit. When you started selling, there was no customers. But they sell, they have 10 customers to refer to. So, you know, it's a, it's a wash. It really depends. But at the, at the worst level, when you know nothing, wishful thinking. What do you want them to do? Right? And then the question is like, how crazy is your wishful thinking? If you're out of your mind, it's going to be a short experience between you and the, these people. And then you hopefully readjust. And, and if you're not, you're not. But the important thing is that the cool thing is that you won't get that right. You won't get the quota perfectly right. Um, you'll readjust. But the cool thing is, as you hire more and more salespeople, if you truly grow the sales side, you'll have outsized uh, returns in certain performers. There'll be people that come in and then the bar is raised. Like they come in and they just kill the quota one month, kill the quota the second month, and be like, new quota, everybody, right? Because we're now proving that this works. And then who is this person? Where did we get this guy and gal? Let's get more of these people. And then the code is different. Like the reality just changed, right? Somebody set a new bar in terms of performance, um, and that you know that's as simple simple as that. Uh, but at the worst case, you, you could also go the other way around. Be like, how much do I pay you? All right, I pay you forty thousand a year, sixty thousand a year. All right, I need to do one hundred and twenty. That's simple math. But if you want to do this profitably, then at least they should do double. You know, ten x would be better. But you start somewhere. Um, but don't like simple math. Either what have you seen? Works. What have you performed? What would you want them to perform? Or to compromise the two? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Guy that's not going to be spending much more time with you. I, I have a I have a whole month for this. Yeah. 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 Um, so like, I know what, one of my questions was like outside inside sales. So like, it is suppose I have like maybe if I have one guy inside one two guys meetings. Like, is there a solution for me? And I mean probably. Yeah. Research them. Um, and then also, do you have like, a recommendation for like how that CRM that would be like a good like way back in? There, there are, there, so send me an email about this. Yeah. I'll give you some options and we can chit chat about this uh, uh, more. Yeah. Questions. Any other questions? Alright. Are you sure it works? So uh, another day for like the bigger way of what we want to do is we want to like get like maybe some sales directors to like kind of buy in, create champions, and then kind of Trojan board site of sales or an organization. Um, like how do you sell from the bottom? Or do you even sell from the bottom? Or do you, do you always start? There was just a strategy that I wanted to try. So that's what you should do. Like the, the, the truth is, I was talking to somebody yesterday, yesterday um, that was like, all right, um, you know, we want to do X, Y, and Z. And I said, all right, there's these three options. One of them was the predictable revenue model, where you go, you don't go to your, directly to your buyer, you go to a person one or two levels above, you ask for introduction to your buyer down in New York. Um, and then I brought up two other options that I see as viable, and I was like, have you tried this option? This is pretty enough well known. He's like, yeah, we tried it, it doesn't work for us. It didn't produce the results. I'm like, all right, should we try this and this? He's like, no, but this strategy really seems exciting. All right, so go try that. What else has you tried? It's like, the funny thing is, they try the bottom up approach. They go to very junior guys. They get them really excited. They get them and they drop up. Then they drop and it's like, and that's been going really well. I've been just keep doing that. The answer is, it depends on the organization. It depends on the hierarchical structure of the business. If that, if the flow upwards is easy or not, depends entirely on the type of business that you sell to. But the way to do that is like the the pitch usually with the young people are the big. They'll use the young people because they bring the excitement, they know what they know what's hip, they know what's cool. So that's usually the appeal that they bring to most senior people. Like I'm gonna show I test everything so I know everything that you don't have time for. So it's something really cool that might be a blind spot. And if the most senior guy respects the junior person, that's why they're listening. You know, like, this kid is really talented, he's really tuned in, and they said this app is really cool, I'll take a look. And then that's how you try to move upwards, but it's the same. I put down the same movement. I learned what are your priorities, what do you care about, what's important to you, and then who's the next person you need to go to. And have you done this before? If not, what can I help you with to make this transition something that makes you look great and helps you accomplish your goals? 
and, and that's how you move, uh, move up the ladder. You know, I talked to Gary Vaynerchuk, I did an interview with him once, just about sales. My question was like, how did you transition? I don't know. Everybody knows Gary V, right? Gary Vaynerchuk? Yeah. Not everybody knows. Who doesn't know Gary Vaynerchuk? Jesus Christ, you see? I will never be as known to be able to ask who is not heard of me and nobody here is there. So, he's a great investor too. He's a great investor. He is Social media all, machine. You, you need to go and search for Gary V. You need to read his book and watch his Oh, three books, yes, three books. Three books, but fuck the books. Don't read the books, just yeah, watch the awesome. show. Here's a show right now that's just purely based on questions people ask him on Twitter. So just sh watch that. So quick background on the guy. The guy started as a wine shop. Right? His dad had like a small wine shop in New York, New Jersey. He took over that wine shop and moved it up to 60 million in business. I made it a big wine, wine business. And then he was one of the first guys when YouTube came out and on that video to start a video show about wine. Started a wine show. Him drinking wine, talking about it for 40 minutes. And because the guy is, the guy doesn't look like a star, but he's a star. He's pretty charismatic. He's an awesome guy, an awesome communicator. He would like drink wine and eat like popcorn and tell him which popcorn goes better or which, like what wine is the most best to drink when you eat Captain Crunch in the morning. Like he would do like cool shit. And he built a massive audience, massive audience. And that translated over to him starting to do a lot of investments and he invested in like Twitter and a bunch of Humbler, other, yeah. Yeah. And a bunch of like major companies. And I was a big investment fund and a big angel investor. But also he started a, a social media agency that, that went from like five people working at it to now 600 people. Yeah. It's a massive agency that's probably in more than 100 million in revenue with like this massive, massive company. And I asked him, I was like, how do you go from selling fucking wine to people, a bottle of wine, to selling the CEO of, of like whatever, IBM or Shell, or like giving you millions to manage all their social media. It's like, it's a totally different world, but it made that transition. He's like, it's the same fucking thing, it's people. It's always Bob. I don't sell to Shell or IBM, I sell to Bob. And if Bob wants wine, I'll sell you wine. If Bob wants a you know, $10 billion social media campaign, I'll sell you a but I, I, the thing I, I care about is Bob is Mary, the person. It doesn't matter the, the logo, is, it's always people. So, um, so that's why it's like, it's easy. Wine, like a $10 item or a $10 million item, it's the same thing. I sell the people. <laughs> it's just like, figure out who they are, what they care about, make them like you, make them care about you. You really understand that, and then you give them what they need. Right? Um, all right, any other more questions? <laughs> Yes. How do you do customer retention when you call people in the first place and these kind of things? Like how do you keep this? Yeah, customer retention. So, you know, as much as you can, right? You should do everything and anything you can to keep your customers happy. If, if the more, so at the beginning, I think the early days, it doesn't matter if it's scalable, is this the right model, no IPO or nothing. But all you want to do is you want to keep hearing from your customers, keep getting insights, keep learning about your problems, and, and all that. Um, eventually, you have to be a bit more clear what you do and how you do it. Uh, for us, for us, we do a lot and we need to do a lot more, which is true for everything we do. We're six first people. We're six people, right? And we have, you know, business-wise, we're much bigger business than the amount of people. So, the six people, who's doing what? Like, how much can you do of anything? Um, so we have to be really smart with the we automate, automate a lot. Uh, and we have a very strong team. Six people are not just average, average performers. They're really, really good at what they do. But uh, we, 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 we're going to hire a lot more people to do a lot better job. I think that um, customer support, customer success is the job of the farmers again. Like support, I can support chat. I pick up the phone we get incoming calls whenever I get a chance. And it's, it's an opportunity to keep your heart on the beat and see what's going on, but it's also a way for you to delight people. And whenever somebody picks, I got a call today and the guy's like, what's your name again? I'm like, I'm Stelly. He's like, I just watched your video, Stelly. I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> shit, all right. Well, I didn't think you would pick up the phone. Ah, cool, let's chat, right? So it makes people go, oh, shit, I talked to the big dude. Um, so customer success, customer support, it's, again, it starts with like, everybody should do it. Everybody should always do a certain amount of support. Always. It's the most, it's the most like humbling, but bringing you to earth of reality type of interaction is your customers struggling. Nobody should be between you and your customers that are struggling. It's a community moment, so we should write this. 
Right? No, but it's seriously, yeah. you should, there's no, there should be no wall between you and people that struggle that are your customers. You need to hear that, you need to feel that pain. You need to listen to them, like tell you what sucks and know it does and take that shit. You know, eat that shit and go, mm, yes, <laughs> you're right. And one of the reasons why, why I say, like, another, another part that kind of relates to this is also pricing. A lot of times people price very low, again, to make it easy make people happy and successful, nobody will complain, and I don't have to sell that part because it's so low of a price <laughs> that life is going to be easy. I say you should go the other way around. Make it price really, really high, so then it goes really hard to make them successful. That pushes you in a different direction. Like, when we started, we started to close out without reporting. It's a sales tool without reporting. Now how painful it is to get all these customers that on day one are like, I fucking love your tool, it's amazing, you're like, yeah. And then like two months later, they're like, I love it, but I have to leave, it's no reporting. And every day you see the customers leaving that you just want. You know, now you could just go, and they're like, especially at your price point, we're at a, we're at a premium price product. So now you can do two things. You can go, just lower the price. So the cheapest thing in town, so this is not as big of a problem anymore. We can just say, well, let's fucking fix this really quickly to live up and exceed the price point. So I think it's a healthy thing to, uh, to do with, uh, you know, with unhappy customers and, and hear about that and then do whatever you can to deliver it. And there's lots of things that you can do, training, support, giving them really good access to things. Like our customers have a live help chat that goes directly into, uh, everybody in our company is in that chat. So when a customer goes in and says, well, this fucking sucks, if nothing else, all engineers are. Right, so the people that are building the product. Not some support person somewhere in the world. Right? We are in that chat. They can call us, they can chat us, they can email us. They can, like I offer sales office to so our customers. You can book a 50 minute call with me to talk about your sales problems. It's nothing to do with my company or software. Right? Really powerful. So whatever we can do, like my, uh, and for those who know Lincoln, if you don't know Lincoln Murphy, 16 Ventures, read everything he writes. He's like the customer success guru. He's an awesome guy. And we did a webinar together, and his, his definition of customer success was like, every and any interaction with your product, any and every interaction a customer has with your product should make them more successful. And, and now, there's no way for me to make this not sound super braggy. I was like, how do I, how do I move forward with this without making this like, I just want to make a point that it was awesome. But I, my definition is wider, and he changed his algorithm to say, any and every interaction of anyone with your company should make them more successful. Not just with the product. Anything. If they, if they, whatever it is, if they, you know, they read a tweet from me, it should make their life more successful. If they buy a product, if they get our support, whatever they do, anything to do with our company, it should make them more successful. That's that's our goal. Right, any more questions? Oh guys, let's just leave it at that. Right? I'm also really tired. Uh -huh. right. Snowy, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Right? Yeah. It's great. Thank you. Really appreciate you coming in. I definitely have you coming for next bunch too. <laughs> All right. Right on. Thanks for having me, my man.